Well, hi there, this is Adam, and welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Today, we've got a chocolatey treat for you, my 73 Mercury Marquee Brome. I would say probably the most comfortable car that I own and maybe the most fun to drive just because it oozes down the road with its water Betty-like ride. And I say that with, well, the highest degree of compliments. This is not a car that you would drive if you want a vehicle that handles well, but it does ride extremely well. And it's not just the ride itself on this car that's great, but the seats, as you'll see, this car has the optional Twin Comfort lounge seats, and this was the last year for the Twin Comfort lounge seats, is just an absolutely fabulous car to take on road trips. And it also has the 460 cubic inch V8 under hood. The 460 was optional in 1973. The 429 was standard. The 460 would become standard in 1974. But overall, this is just one of these great vehicles to drive wherever you're going. And I have a 74 marquee, and I'd actually say it probably even rides a little bit better, but it's just a standard marquee, and by that point, they had done away with these high back twin comfort lounge seats. They had gone to a cheaper solution. And so it's just not quite as great as this. And I think the 460 in this car feels a little bit peppier too than it does for 1974. And it did have a little bit more power. So I thought we would just talk a little bit about the vehicle and some of its strange features, quirks, and idiosyncrasies because there are a number of them but they're all charming. I have to say in terms of vehicles that really achieve their mission, this car is at the top of the list. This would have been a car that the road test people and the buff books back at the time really loathed. But I would just contend that they really didn't understand what the mission was. The mission of this car was not to be flying around corners and let's say going around the racetrack. That was not the mission at all. The mission was really just to soak up the ride and provide an extremely isolated experience for the driver and whatever passengers were in the car. And when it comes to that, this car, honestly, it's a 10 out of 10. So it's really sad from my perspective that I guess the evaluators of the time didn't understand or didn't care about the purpose of this car and really kind of panned it in similar vehicles as dinosaurs that you know just didn't handle very well and weren't that rewarding to drive but that wasn't the purpose of the vehicle it was to just be an isolation chamber in every aspect from seating comfort to quietness to steering to brake feel so that you don't feel the road the objective here was not to feel the road through the steering wheel and get any feedback it was to be completely isolated in any case let's talk a little bit more and walk around the car about some of these cool, strange features, quirks, idiosyncrasies, etc. All right, well, let's walk around this 73 Marquis Brome and talk about the wonderful, strange features of this. The first is, let's start with the front, and that is this grill, which in 73 was die cast. 72 was plastic, 74 was plastic. For whatever reason, in 73, they decided that they wanted a die cast grill in that year only. So it's going to hold up, whereas some of the earlier and later grills, you'll get chipped teeth on them. 71 grill was also plastic. Again, not quite sure why Mercury decided that this is what they wanted, but they did for that model year and that model year alone. The second thing here is these so-called garage door or hidden headlights, which for 73 went to a dual actuator system. There's one actuator on either side here as opposed to one in the middle that the 71 and 72 had. So this was a more expensive setup. Unfortunately it's also more failure prone. Let's see if we can take a look under here. This car is from New Mexico so this is just some sand here and there you go. There's the actuator. So that's one. There's one on either side. But unfortunately, these actuators now are prone to rusting because the system traps moisture and then they actually rust from the inside out as opposed to rusting from the outside in, getting hard to find, and then your headlamp doors pop open pretty quickly or right after you shut the car off. Thankfully, as you can see, these stay closed for some period of time. Next, we have... This feature here, this Mercury emblem, or I guess the Lincoln Mercury crest, which clearly is a Lincoln emblem that's laid sideways with some little slats here and a wreath around it. In 75, this would rotate 
vertically and have the wreath go around it. So 73 and 4 only. This is the Lincoln Mercury emblem and clearly is robbing from Lincoln there. They also introduced this new script Mercury for 1973. It was over here. For a number of years Mercury had put this Mercury nameplate in the driver's side area but they decided to change the font for 73. I guess it's and it's a little bit smaller I would say font size than in other years so wanted to make it look a little less pronounced. Of course you can see this car has the big bumpers in the front. This is the first year of the federal five mile an hour impact standard up front and as a consequence you have this huge offset from the body and you have that to some degree in the rear although 74 was when they had this five mile an hour impact standard in the rear. I think it was just a two and a half mile per hour standard in the rear for 73. Next we have this styling theme of the Mercury's which really was patterned off of Lincoln and that is this trough that you see here that goes all the way back to the door. It's kind of this little concave surface here. This was not a feature of the Fords. If you look at the LTDs of the era you don't have this but this was a feature that Lincoln had for many years you can even see it like on my Mark III, they had it during these years. And of course, Mercury was trying to pick up on that because this was the Lincoln Mercury division. This is one of those things that I think only designers maybe recognize. I don't know that people or the average buyer would recognize that this trough is kind of a Lincoln trait that Mercury picked up, but it was, and you have it here. Of course, in 73, you can see the rear quarter glass drops down on this vehicle. Most of the time, these windows aren't working. The torque pins are made of plastic and they've been long since chewed up. But Tony Lawler of Tony's Car Care in Vandalia, Illinois, check out his YouTube channel, Tony's Car Care. And he repaired these and he's repaired a number of them, which requires taking out the back seat, taking off this trim panel and everything there. And uh, well, let's just say I leave it to Tony. I think you have to take not only the bottom cushion, you also have to take the top cushion out. Take a look at his channel and you can see where he's repaired many of my Mercury's. So all the power windows function again. Next on the exterior, we have these wheel covers. These were the standard wheel colors when you got a glamour metallic paint. If you didn't get a glamour metallic paint, you just got kind of a brushed look, unpainted wheel cover. But this is Ginger Glamour Metallic is the name of this color. This was an optional color for 73. And as a consequence, you get the painted wheel colors, or sorry, wheel covers, which are very Mercedes-esque, <laughs> kind of humorous. This car is not trying to emulate a Mercedes at all, but that was a popular trait that various domestic auto companies would pick up on. Even AMC on the 78 Concorde, as an example, had these body color wheel covers Again, pattern off of Mercedes, and Mercedes would lend a few styling cues to domestic auto companies. If you look at some of the early SL convertibles, they have these strikes running down here on the side. Well, Pontiac would pick that up, and that would later become the ribs of the Pontiac. Out rear, you have a one-year-only rear. And again, as I said, this is 73 before the 74 five-mile-an-hour impact standard came in, so the rear would change. In 72 and 73, you don't have a trunk lock cover. They costed it out. You just have an open lock cylinder. 74, they go back to the trunk lock cover. So it does look a little pedestrian. You almost want to have your trunk lock cover here, but it doesn't exist. And by the way, you kind of see the glamour metallic here. It's a beautiful metallic color. This is the original paint on this car, thankfully in good condition. And like I said, it was from New Mexico when I bought it. It was a little sun faded, but it polished right back up and so did the vinyl top. I mean, the vinyl top is perfect on this car, as you can see here. Now, another feature, notice this little depression in the vinyl top that you're going to see on either side. It's pretty typical of 70s era cars, and that's because this is the joint where the quarter panel meets the roof. And on the vinyl top cars, it wasn't finished. On the non-vinyl top cars, they would metal finish this. So what happens over time, because this is not a padded top, there's no padding under here, it's just firm, is that you kind of get the vinyl top sinking in and this seam becomes more prevalent. And again, that's because that joint was not finished. It's just one of those little character traits now. 
obviously you have fender skirts in this car, enormous fender skirts. And in true luxury fashion, you have this rocker molding that runs the full length of the car and becomes this pretty prevalent piece here, which this car doesn't have cornering lights, but that's where the cornering light would be. Rocker moldings, for whatever reason, designers thought that that jazzed the car up, and it does. It gives it a little bit of chrome down low. You don't see that anymore. I wish this car didn't have the optional body side molding, but almost all these came with it. I think it would look better without it, but oh well. Can't go back to your Lincoln Mercury dealer and order one any longer. The 73 also was a bit more conventionally styled than the 71 and 2 and the 69 and 70, candidly, when this was introduced. The 69 would be the first year of this body style and it would also have hidden headlights, very beautiful front end. But in 73, they went to this more conventional upper, kind of a stiffer car, not too much surfacing here on the body side. It's got some slight curvature to it. And then you see this what so-called drag section at the bottom here, because if you're a clay modeler, you'd make a template and you'd just drag it across the clay, forming a surface all the way back. So there's really not much definition to it. And that was pretty characteristic of Ford styling during the era. If you looked at GM cars, even of this era, they had quite a bit of tumble home and uniqueness to the surfacing. And Ford just had a different philosophy for the surfacing. You, it's almost like you make a template and then you drag it all the way across the clay. And once you see that on Ford cars, you compare it to General Motors vehicles, you really can't unsee it. And Fords, of course, were always a bit boxier than the GMs, especially toward the end of Gene Bordenay's tenure, like the Lincoln Mark VI. You get these really flat fenders. This one does have a very gentle rise to it which is good. A Mark III is almost perfectly level. And the belt line here is again, perfectly flat. I do like how it curves up here as part of the DLO. And you've got this chunky bright molding around the daylight opening. This also is a very small daylight opening here. This is not very big. Of all the domestics, I mean, this is probably, I would say 15 inches wide, not very wide at all. Of all the domestics, the Ford coupes of this era and the hardtops had the lowest roof lines and the highest belt lines. So very modern day sports car-y proportions with this squinty greenhouse, almost a chopped roof, raised lower section. Uh, and you don't have that great of visibility as a consequence as you do in other vehicles because of that. You can see the daylight opening is not all that tall in this car. Same with the windshield. There's only about a foot from the top of the dash to the top of the headliner. And that was just Ford styling during this time frame. Of course, on the brome trims, you got these lions. Somebody corrected me. I thought they were griffins, but they're not. They have tails, so they're clearly lions. Have to symbolize that you got something extra. And turning now to the inside, you have the first year of this new dashboard that was shared between Ford and Mercury and later would be shared by Lincoln in the late 1970s. The seven, in 71 and 72, Ford and Mercury would have different dashboards. In 73, they went to this common dashboard. And 73 is the only year with the white index pointer here for the speedometer, the fuel gauge, as well as the shift indicator down here in 74 it would go to be a reddish orange indicator. And you could tell why it's kind of blends in overall, but very similar dash. They all had this huge glove box, as you can see here. It did have a little bit different fence and center area. 73 is also a one year only top pad that has this little radius here. I don't know why they did that only for one year. They changed it in 74 and then kept that new top pad from 74 through 78. 73 is also a one year only door panel, which has this full armrest that is hard plastic on the bottom, unfortunately. It does have a padded portion at the top, but the 71 and 2 door panels were completely soft touch. Still a nice door panel, but a little bit eh, cheaper. Although I do like the ostrich print cloth in here. I think that's pretty sweet. And as I mentioned, you get these high back 
seats, which are extremely comfortable. I mean, look at this armrest. Why don't they make armrests with padding anymore? Please, if there's any designers or engineers out there, can you please put more padding in your armrests? I hate driving in long distances in new cars because you rest your arm on the armrest and there's like a quarter inch of padding and after a while your elbow just is chafing. But this is all padding. There's nothing rigid in this thing at all. So it's great. And of course you got two armrests as opposed to just one. And this is a cruise control equipped car. You got a separate wheel and a rim blow horn that you pinch the rim and it honks the horn. Unfortunately, this one sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. I gotta redo it, but oh well. This also has the 8-track tape player, AM, FM radio. You put your 8-track tape in there and if you wanna change the eight tracks, you depress the volume knob here, listen. That's how you change between the eight tracks. And the rest of the radio functions normally. This car does have a clock that is right twice a day, as is typical. Some people ask me, why don't I fix the clocks in these cars? Uh, well, I, I wear a watch, <laughs> and it's just not worth... This dashboard is in beautiful condition, and I just hesitate to take it apart, and I really don't care if it tells the time anyway. I usually unhook the batteries, too, uh, as I store these, so it's just not an element for me that I really care to maintain. I'd rather put the effort into maintaining the rest of the vehicle than the clock. And by the way, you can have the clock rebuilt and then probably stops working another two, three years after you have it rebuilt. In terms of the rest of the interior, you can see, like I said, these windows go down and that would get costed out in 75. They would become fixed windows and they'd also eventually cost out even the rear armrests, which this car has. So Ford got cheap in the mid and late 70s, and that's why I prefer the 73, 74 examples versus the later 70s examples. Let's take a look under hood, as well as at the trunk. We'll start with the trunk first, then we'll go under hood. So let's take the keys and examine how big this trunk is. So here we have it, the typical Ford deep well trunk, and it's a deep well because the fuel tank is vertical behind the rear seat there. So you can get all of this room. Some people love this, some people hate it. The lift over is very high. You can see this trunk is very deep and so if you put groceries in there you got to stoop down to get it. The upside is you get a heck of a lot of cargo space. Here I've got the original floor mats and then the shoulder belts which I've taken off because I like to drive with the windows down and they kind of flap around and well let's just say if you're getting in an accident in this car and you're wearing your lap belt you're not going to lose. This thing is pretty hefty. I've even got some spare. Well, these are the original wheel covers back here. They had a few chips. I found an NOS set that I put on the car that looked brand new. So just a massive trunk. And Ford would keep this deep well trunk even through the Crown Vicks and the Town Cars and Grand Marquis until the very end. So I guess some people like it. I like it. Let's pop the hood now and take a look at the optional 460. I think the 460 was ordered on about a third of all the vehicles, these marquees that were built in 1973. The 429 again was standard, both basically about the same horsepower in the low 200s, but I'll tell you from a torque perspective, you really, you don't, it feels like this car's got a lot more power. And this one has a traction lock rear end. That's actually a 325, I believe, rear end. You can tell if you have a traction lock or positive traction rear end. If you look at the data plate here and you see the axle says R, if it's a letter, it's a traction lock. If it's a number, it's an open diff. You want the letter, that's a better setup. Still has the original air conditioning compressor. It's been converted, previous owner converted it and it's icy cold. I can't complain about how cold it is. I did recore the radiator. These aren't that big of a radiator. They're very large, but they're only two core. And again, this car was from New Mexico. The core was getting a little weak. So I redid that. Obviously new upper radiator hose, put a new thermostat in it. This was before the electronic ignition. This car still has points and condenser. 
before but later in 74 they put the electronic box i think over there that big silver box which was a decent setup sometimes those boxes would crap out another great thing about this car is the heater core replacement if you ever have to replace it you just take this little access panel off right here you see the two hoses coming in and out of the heater core take the access panel off and you take the core right out from there it's maybe for an average i'll call it amateur mechanic a couple hour job especially if you got power tools to i always use power tools to undo the sheet metal screws and things and i usually hand thread them back in just so that I'm not stripping anything. But to take them out, you can use the power tools and that saves a lot of time. We're also coming to the final years of this two piston air conditioning compressor before it would become converted. They would start using the GMA6 air conditioning compressor in 72 Lincoln was using the GMA6, but Mercury is still making do with this. I think it works just fine. I, again, I can't complain. They did improve the capacity of these systems. This is four pounds of R12 in the late 60s versions they only took about two and a half two and three quarter pounds so the system was getting bigger but ford found that especially on the wagons and in the dark colors they needed something better and they went to the gma6 compressor it does have a gm saginaw steering pump though so for you ford lovers who don't like the gms and piss on the gms well you got a saginaw steering pump there some fords even have saginaw steering boxes and you'd have gm harrison air conditioning the lincoln's had that by this time that's the cruise control servo up there. And you see all these coffee cans or high C juice cans with all the vacuum lines running everything from the HVAC setup to the headlamp doors. And I will say one thing that's interesting. If anybody's got a better way to do this, let me know. See that alternator belt down there is pretty wimpy. It's not very big. It's so small that you can't get it around the fan and you have to take the fan off to get the alternator belt on. If anybody knows a better way, let me know. But I tried on this car, I had to put a new belt on and had to take the fan blades off. Uh, I just thought that was simpler than, well, trying to figure out how to do it otherwise. Maybe, maybe there's some easy way that I just didn't figure out. And this car is super smooth. Let me put the keys back in and we'll do the reach in start. You do see first year of the EGR valve back there. Right there on the carburetor. There's a nice smooth operator, if you will. You need to put a new AC belt on. Some of these belts are getting a little Oh, they just didn't have one when I was putting the new alternator belt on, so I didn't do it. And those are easy to replace. You can have those off in five minutes. This car just has a single exhaust, but very, very quiet. You also have, by the way, 73 Ford would go to these door handles that protruded from the body as opposed to being flush with the body. So you also have these door handles, which for 73 Ford would go to a door handle that would protrude from the body versus being flush from the body. Not quite sure why they did that. I guess maybe so you could see it better, but that's what they did. Well, let's close it up and take it for a little ride. Oh, oozy woozy goodness. Oh, I love this car. Just so smooth and quiet and powerful. It's so funny you compare the ride in this and even the seats, as you can see, to my New Yorker and I mean, there's just no comparison from a ride perspective. Although the handling in the New Yorker is better than the handling in this car. But ride, no comparison. Oh, 
Oh yeah. So quiet, so smooth. Gotta love it. Well, and there you have it. A ride in the wonderful 73 Marquis Pro. Hope you enjoyed this feature. Uh, strange quirks, idiosyncrasies, and unique features. Till next time, take care.